Okay. Hello, everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, we're here. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Podish Sorta Cast. Uh, I guess today it's it was just me, and I can't carry a show by myself. So I brought along a student. This is Violet. Hello. And uh, she's been working with me on a little project in, in local biodiversity. And so I'll just cue you in on something right now that this, this is advertised on YouTube as a bunch of spiders. And there will be a bunch of spiders. So if you're arachnophobic, escape quickly. But we're also going to talk about a lot of other things. So um, where I got into this business was many years ago. I guess it was like six or seven. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Um, I was working on zebrafish and getting a little bit exasperated because I was I was starting to shift my interests. In particular, I'll throw this up here. Uh, this book came into my hands. I actually taught a course around this. Uh, it's Ecological Developmental Biology by Scott Gilbert and David Apple. Uh, those of you in developmental biology almost certainly have heard of Scott Gilbert. Scott, Scott Gilbert wrote the the most common, most popular college level development, developmental biology course book. So he started branching off too. I guess it's something that happens when you get old and gray as you start exploring new things. And so he was interested in ecology and the environment and how development and ecology influence each other. And so he put together the resources for this whole textbook on this subject. Uh, it's a field called EcoDevo. And I started getting interested in this oh, about when this book came out, which is over 10 years ago, and was really interested in this interaction between the environment and developing organisms. Uh, the catch was I, was, I was a zebrafish person. I was working on zebrafish. And zebrafish are a model system that um, is not local, local at all. It's a tropical fish from India and Nepal. And so if you want to study the ecology of zebrafish, well, you can't do it here. It just, they don't live here, especially not in Minnesota, they'd be dead. So um, I was thinking about what other things could I do and uh, I started looking around and I found some papers on this interesting new model organism. See, I'm still, I'm still in the model organism mindset. These interesting papers on Parasteatoda, uh, the spider, the house spider. And that was sounded interesting. So I went out to my garage and discovered that my garage is full of Parasteatoda. It still is. I was catching a bunch to this weekend. So um, it, it's a really easy organism to work with. They're really common. They're prolific. That makes them sound perfect for studying developmental biology. Because uh, that's what you want. You want something you can confine in a lab and reduce the number of variables and just work this one organism to death, figuring out what makes it tick. But again, I said, I was, I was sneaking into this by way of my interest in EcoDevo. And uh, so what I also wanted to do was take a look at all the different other organisms that are around. In particular, I was dazzled because, yeah, I went out to the garage and I found all these Parasteatoda tepidariorum, but I also found Steatoda triangulosa and Steatoda borealis, and I found Fulcus. My garage is full of all these different species of spiders. So is yours, by the way. So don't be surprised. It's not because I'm a bad housekeeper. Everyone's house has got those in them. So that got me really interested in exploring the interactions between these. So that was the dream, is someday I'll know enough about this spider so I can look at all the different other species. And we have started working on one other species, Steatota triangulosa, trying to build up our information about that. So it's comparable to Parasteatota. 
So we're, we're all working on this. Uh, Viola here just started my lab this year. And her interests are in, in not just in spiders, but everything, right? I love uh, a lot of arth arthropods. I really uh -huh. like beetles and dragonflies, but spiders are cool too. Yeah, yeah. And that's fine. When I started out, I was just thinking anything would do. It's just that spiders were convenient. Um, another aspect of this that interested me was uh, you've all heard that there's a major insect decline, right? That the population of insects has been dropping rather profoundly and worrisomely. Uh, we started seeing that really obviously around here because when I would be driving around, when I first got here 20 years ago, you go for a drive and your car would be splattered with insects all over. Uh, you can go out for a drive today and hardly get anything. You don't get those windshield splats. You don't get the grill full of bugs. So there's something going on and that's worrisome. So one of the things I was thinking about with the spiders is using those as a proxy for insects because there are fewer spiders and fewer species of spiders than there are insects, which makes them a little more manageable, especially since I'm new to the whole idea. So um, that's kind of where that's kind of where Violet's coming in here because she is. Oh, you talk. You tell them what you're interested in. Explain all this whole deal about the campus and grass lawn, grassy lawns and all this kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'm a student here at the University of Minnesota Morris, and I major in environmental studies. And I got really interested in that decline of insects over time that we're seeing and how lawns and lawn culture might be playing a big role in that and the pesticides everybody play, uh, sprays on their, their properties. So I wanted to take a look at um, what kind of insects and other arthropods do we find on a manicured lawn versus in a managed native plant area versus a, an abandoned place where whatever can grow there does grow there. So that's, that's what we've been doing. We've, we've been comparing those three kind of uh, environments to each other. And yeah, we find, we find far fewer insects on, on the lawns on campus than we do in more wild areas, but I've, we've only really just started to gather quantifiable mm -hmm. data, but it seems that far and away the best place for insects is the place where people don't, are just hands off. Like you've got a, an area of land that nobody's spraying or cutting, nobody cares what kind of plants grow there. I find way more density and diversity of life there than I do even in a native plant garden on campus. So I, I don't know if they're spraying pesticides in those gardens or what that is about. We should probably find out yes. how they care for those. But we're starting to see some, some data that's definitely damning evidence for lawns because the native plants are far better than the lawns. And much more interesting, yes. Yeah, so we've got, we've got a couple of plots that Violet is looking into. Uh, one is on campus, a big grassy area, right? Mm -hmm. And then another one is we've got a, li a little strip here on campus that's dedicated to native plants. So that one, I think it, it's not mowed or anything, but every couple of years they do a burn through it. Yeah. And that's, that's okay, that's part of the natural cycle. And then there's this spot on the uh, on the west side of town that it's near the railroad tracks and it's got junk in it and it's just neglected. It's got a pile of old sticks just lying there. And, and so that's a different kind of environment altogether, a neglected environment. Mm -hmm. So we're comparing those things just to see what things look like. And I'll show you some pictures in a moment of what, what Violet has found out there. I should mention as well that this has been a big change because I, I was, I've always been a, a lab nerd, you know, sitting here under fluorescence all the time. And the past couple of years, I've had to start getting out and wandering around in the sunshine. And also, if you could see my bench here, Violet has brought dirt into my lab. There's a rock. 
<laughs> and that's okay. That's just that's part of the business is because we're now we're now gathering all this stuff from outside and we bring it into the lab so that we can look through it and characterize the species that we find there. So that's that's all fun stuff. So let's look at some pictures. That's that's what we're all here for, right? So let me switch this out. Okay, there we are. So that's just black, but that's to set me up. And then uh, I thought I'd show this cute picture next. So this is my granddaughter. She's four years old. She's in preschool. And look, this preschool has their priorities straight. Uh, they're learning about the environment and ecology and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so that's that's her little, that's her poster that she made. So there's energy, water, air, plants, animals, biome. That's a new word for a four-year-old. I didn't know biome when I was that age. That, see, there, this new generation is just going to lap us. Anyway, so the, the point there is that this is an important topic. I think it's important that enough that I have switched over to getting more interest in pursuing this. And I also want to integrate it with my what I do know about developmental biology. So that's that's our future there. What is that? Is that soil is soil. One? Oh yes, it also says soil. The backwards S got me. Yeah. Yes. It looks like two, it looks like 20 FL is what it looks like. To yeah, me. but I no, think, it's soil. Yeah. I think it's soil. Okay all important things so good okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn this over to violet um all i gotta do is use the arrow keys i gotta get over there then yeah you might want to get a little closer or i could turn the keyboard to you there you go that that, that works a lot better yeah cool. so this is some sort of damselfly that i've tentatively identified as some sort of bluet. I thought oh, that's going to be easy to identify. It looks really unique. There's so many species that look like that. It's very frustrating. Oh yeah. But the Odonata are just, oh, there's so many. They're a very successful group. But that's part of the fun that uh, I've been having is going around with uh, the camera PZ lent me and just identifying things, mm -hmm. learning how to identify things. Um, so we, I see a lot of these bluets flying around in places with native plants or places that are neglected, wild grown places. I've never seen one uh, in a, an area that's all manicured lawns. Right. Oh, well, I, I'll, I'll make an exception to that. So this was taken at Glacial Lakes, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think all the photos we okay. have are Glacial Lakes. Uh, there will come a time in August when suddenly the lawns are going to be covered with damselflies because that's when the ants emerge and go on their nuptial flights. Yes. The ants are yeah. one of the only things I ever find in the lawns. Yes. So in, in August, the ants will emerge and they'll start flying all over. There'll be winged ants everywhere. And then we'll see lots of these guys cruising around the lawns. And then they'll go away as quickly as they can. Yes. Well, I in, since I've been doing my observations this this summer, yeah. I've not seen any of these guys in a in a lawn area. Um very near where I took that picture. Uh this is a crab spider. Mm -hmm of some sort ground crab spider i want to say probably yeah and uh something else i've not been seeing in lawns yeah you can sometimes find the these in gardens around the area but yeah there's nothing for them in lawns no. at all yeah so seeing a spider is in some ways more exciting than seeing um smaller insects dragonflies are and, and damselflies are actually in the same category as spiders in a way because they're the predators mm -hmm. so you need a healthy base of small in prey insects in order to support a population of predators um 
I'm still still learning how to focus the camera, so <laughs> it's a little fuzzy, but it gets better. Uh, yeah, ticks. The reason people don't want to leave their lawns. I've not found a lot of ticks in. I haven't found any this summer in in mowed lawns. I don't know about you. No, I haven't either. But you can find them in leaf litter. So if you if you mow your lawn and just leave all the moldering grasses out there and in the fall when the leaves accumulate um, you don't want to go rolling in the leaves because this is who lives there but we want people to leave the leaf litter yes so you're you're telling people the leaf litter is going to bring ticks and oh. then they're going to want to get rid of their leaves then what we need to do is foster an appreciation of arachnids yeah so actually <laughs> yeah I, I agree with that um on the topic of leaf litter one of the um the things about the native plant garden and the area by the tracks that nobody cares about is there's no leaf litter there in the in the native plant garden uh -huh. um if there's a deadfall like a, a tree branch or something uh or a dead animal like an animal dies in there facility is going to come and take that stuff away people rake that stuff out um by the tracks there's piles of dead wood there's a good layer of dead sticks and leaf litter and then under that healthier dirt it's easier to dig there because it's not just this dead dry soil it's actually yes bio it's layers of of biodegrading stuff being returned to the soil our um, famous prairie soil that we should be taking better care of yeah. And I think that's a really big part of why I see such a big step up in the neglected areas compared to the native garden is uh -huh. because we're not preventing those things from returning to, because you take that stuff away, that's energy you're removing from the area. There are a lot of things that feed off of that stuff. Um, so this tick, I, I found this crawling on me and I said, you're, you're going to be a subject for my, my photography. <laughs> And that's, did you put the mosquito in here too? Yes, I did. I did, yeah. I've, I had to. <laughs> oh, yes. Tent moth, tent caterpillar moths, if I remember correctly. Yeah. We, we found lots of these in Glacier Lakes Park. Uh -huh. They looked like uh, like they they just sit on the tree branches and wiggle together. Um, they were not easy to photograph because they like to wiggle, but um, I haven't seen any caterpillars outside of the state park. I've seen a few in town, but nothing like what we see out there. Yeah. Yeah, I think people tend to do whatever they can to get rid of them, especially tent caterpillars. Yeah, they're like a, a nuisance, aren't they? Yeah. They, they? they come in great numbers and eat everything. Well, and they form these massive, to human eyes, unsightly nests in the trees. I like those. I think yeah. they look cool. Yeah, and then people come and cut them down. Just let nature do nature. Let it be. Let it do its thing. Let nature I be agree. nature. I agree. Yeah. You know, leave the deadfalls. Leave the tent caterpillars. Tents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've got a uh, dragonfly friend. I don't know what species of dragonfly that is. I don't know either. I put it on a naturalist and just said dragonfly. Uh, <laughs> but uh, just like the damselflies, I said, they're a lot harder to photograph than the damselflies, though. They're very skittish and fast. Yeah. It's hard to get close to them. And with the exception of this one, who decided to be a bro and uh -huh. chill out for, the, for a little bit. And this is, again, at Glacier Lakes. If you go anywhere where we have lakes and ponds, that's where you find all these things. Um, I should mention, we discovered a new area out by the track and field area on campus. And there's this really swampy area and we saw damselflies out there. So there's some within walking distance. Yeah, so healthy, undisturbed water is a vital part of damsel and dragonfly, it's reproductive cycle. Uh -huh. They spend the first part as like nymphs in water. So I think we have a nymph picture. In a there. nymph husk somewhere yes. ahead. Um, but yeah, that's just another ecos, another biome that we need to be aware of. Wetlands are important. Yes. 
this. Oh yeah, this is this is a crab spider. A couple of them. Two of them. And uh, my my other student, Liz, actually found these walking. She was really good at walking face first in the spiders. Yes, you? these were mating suspended from a web attached to the canopy above us, and she nearly walked into their uh -huh. nasty doing. <laughs> No, it's love. It's beautiful. She yeah. she nearly walked into their love. And then we rudely disturbed them. Although the female didn't, she wasn't having any of it. She was right. Well, the female is pretty clearly already gravid. Mm -hmm. So she's she's got a load of eggs in there. She doesn't need any male interference in her business. I say mm-hmm as if I I observed that too. I don't oh. know. <laughs> I didn't recognize that. Did you put any more pictures of them in here or? Uh, I don't like the. Is there another one? Oh, that's a different spider. Yeah, that's. Is that that's a? I can't see its butt. Is that a borealis or a peristeatoda? No, I think that's peristeatoda. Yeah. We yeah. found that under again at Glacier Lakes. That was by the lake. I think he called it, it was Signalness Lake. I might be saying that really wrong. Um, they had a. a overturned boat there for emergency purposes only and oh we, yeah right. we looked underneath it and there were a bunch of these i should have taken more pictures of them but uh-huh there was so much to take pictures of there you can just go to my garage anytime we have these are all over in there so i've i'm we only there's like i only saw that species of spider in glacial lakes on the boat i only see them in town uh and like buildings and stuff i never yeah. see this species of spider just like hanging out on a flower or something so all right well you can find them occasionally but these are this is a synanthropic species they like to hang out with they like to hang out in human environments they don't like people so much but they like the stuff we built yes they like those nice secure buildings that you, you can clamber into and that there are lots of bugs crawling around in There's our nymph husk. So you yeah. can see the hole where the adult dragonfly crawled out of its former mortal vessel. Uh -huh. I think they have the coolest life cycle. Yes, they're, they're vicious predators all the time. Yes, they are. I was hoping to get a picture of, um, like I was hoping to find one still in its nymph mm -hmm. form, but they stay underwater until they're ready to come out and right. emerge from the husk so you got to be there when it's happening yeah i didn't see any of that i just saw the uh aftermath uh, i've seen it before though it's really cool and really gross uh -huh. and it's crazy how they fit inside because they come out and they unfold and they're way bigger than they were before and oh yeah they really scrunch in there yeah have you ever seen a centipede mold no oh is it the same thing no, they they back out lengthwise through the. It's it's kind of a it's freaky to see, but uh, yeah, they're fun too. Yeah, I think it's cool because caterpillar pupa just sit there, uh -huh. completely helpless. Um, when the uh, dragonfly is in its larval slash pupa form, it's like a tank. Yeah. It's, it's, if uh, I can interject too, the the talk of predators uh, prompted some a question from the chat as well too. Oh, what's as, that? As someone was asking, um, if predators like spiders are an indicator of you know a healthy ecosystem, uh, what about uh, the uh, beasts that eat them? So insectivores like hedgehogs and such. I uh, yeah, you know, there's there's a whole there's a whole chain of organisms that are that are feeding on each other. Um, around here in an urban environment, you're typically only going to get things like top level arthropods, like spiders and dragonflies and so forth. Dragonflies, yeah, if you're lucky. Um, but yeah, I've got, I've got groundhogs and skunks at my house, but I don't think this exactly counts as a fully urban environment. Our spider and dragonfly and pred other predator and arthropod populations definitely support bird populations oh yeah um i i haven't seen a lot of mammal insectivores around here but 
Right. If they, they were here, that would be an indicator of a healthy. They tend to be nocturnal, so you're not going to see much of them. I don't know. Yeah. But you can see the effects of bird predation on the spiders because they have a stereotypical escape behavior, which is if you disturb them, they drop instantly to the ground. And I bet you that's because their main predator is going to be a bird. So by going to ground, you might be able to scuttle away and escape it. It wouldn't help if it was something like a rat or a human being, because I just sit there and catch them as they drop. It also is distressing knowing that they do that when you've got a spider on your ceiling you're trying to capture or kill. Because oh. if you miss, it's going to drop on you. Uh -huh. And you got a spider in your face. It's just trying to get away. Well, it feels targeted, you know, <laughs> like, well, okay, I'm on your face now. But yeah, I mean, the further you can go up the uh, food chain with your trophic levels, the better your ecosystem is. Right. Who's next? The snail. Mm -hmm. I found this guy in the muck by the same lake, and I rudely put him on a bench to get some pictures, but I, I put him back when I was done. Um you also found a snail in the lawn area that was weird it was after a rain yeah it had things wet it had yeah. rained things were wet and there was a snail in the our maintained manicured lawn test area which was unexpected i didn't expect i didn't expect to see i know snails don't all live in yeah. water all the time but i've never i didn't expect to see a snail on the uh the mowed lawn Another factor there, though, is automated sprinklers. Yeah, I haven't <laughs> found any on that lawn yet, but it's yeah. a nice, green, moist lawn, so I suspect they do pop up out of the ground and yeah. spray over there. Yeah. We're pretty good at creating specialized environments. Yeah. So a lot of water is wasted keeping grass green. And taking care of the snails. Well, the snails are cool. <laughs> but they... We don't, we, we could just be prairie grass there, you know, something right. that doesn't need as much water. And when the grass turns brown, it's not even dead. It's just like dormant. Mm -hmm. but it's got to be green all the time. I don't know what this is other than a true bug of some sort, I think. Yeah, I don't know either. I thought maybe an assassin bug. The Seek iNaturalist AI can't even see it. It's very well camouflaged, uh -huh. so that's no help. Yes, I've told all my students that don't ask me about insects. I don't know anything about insects. A little bit, but not much. And so, yeah, I see something like this, and I think that's really cool, but I don't know who that is. Yeah. Yeah, I almost didn't find it because it just looks like the tree bark. It's also oh. a really good picture, nice macro photo of tree bark. <laughs> you know, if you want to look at the... Uh, I don't, I don't know what kind of tree that was. I, I don't know my trees, but I don't either. It's a nice S picture of bark. Seek, I could have told you that. <laughs> yeah. That was, um that actually, because the snail was Glacial Lakes, but this guy was in the lot by the train tracks. So this was, oh, okay. This was that, um, I don't like using the word neglected. I feel like it has a negative connotation, okay. but the the um the hands off approach. The the feral strip of land. <laughs> yes, feral is so much more positive. Yeah. Um the the uh the untouched area. So that's where we found that. And then we've got, I think that's a chalk fronted corporal dragonfly. I don't know why I'm looking at uh -huh. you. You don't you don't know your insects. I don't know my insects. What yeah. kind of insect is that? um it's a dragonfly it's an ant no oh there's the there ant. is an yeah. ant yes um yeah they the dragonflies and damselflies i got this one behind the science building in that little strip of native grass uh -huh. we we're talking native plants we we're talking about they like it there i see them in great density there and you walk 20 feet away into the lawn and there's none of them yeah. so and, and that's one of the things we want to accomplish with this project is to be able to go to the university administration and tell them, yeah, the grass is nice, but there's something much nicer. Mm -hmm. We should we should be spreading more of this kind of prairie environment because it looks good and it's 
its own theme for the university and things like that. Because what the dragonflies are going for is their their prey is living in the native garden. Mm -hmm. And the problem we face in addition to showing people that the insects thrive in the native plants is also convincing people they want that, that we that's a good idea. Because they right. the reason part of the reason for all the lawns and the pesticides is to get rid of the insects, and that's just a shame. We're doing a really good job of it. There is a concerning decline of, of mm -hmm. insects on a global scale. And I don't I don't like it. Same spot, but tiny little grasshopper. Very cute. Um, I don't know if this is a small species of grasshopper or if this is a young grasshopper because I've seen much larger grasshoppers. Yeah, this is probably a young one. Uh, they, they will get much bigger in around about August and we'll start seeing lots of good sized grasshoppers like this hopping yeah. around. The big ones I see have like a, a, a sheath of wings over the top of them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if this one's this one appears to not have that. Yeah. Maybe they develop that later in their cycle. Yes, they do. So, so that looks like a nymphal stage of some sort. Yeah. Learning about grasshoppers. And Salticus senecus? I think so. Ooh, I did it. Zebra stripe, zebra spiders, zebra jumping yes. spiders. And I'm I'm guessing from the pelts and the color pattern, it's probably a male. The palps are not in focus. Yeah, but they look, you know, if they were, you'd see they're, they're kind of prominent. Down. I believe you. I'm just, I'm yeah. still, still learning how to use the camera. And the females tend to have um, more of a zebra stripe look. You can see how it's kind of, this, these stripes are kind of interrupted. Mm -hmm. And you see that a lot in the males. Yeah. So I found this, again, in those native plants. They, uh, there's a lot of life back there that isn't on the lawns. So mm -hmm. this is finding stuff to eat as well. And a ground beetle, same, same wall. All of this is on that wall above the, uh, uh -huh. above the native plants. I love beetles. I don't. I, I would assume that this is another predator species. Probably big and they yes, have jaws. Beetles. Yeah. But yeah, I'm not an expert. <laughs> I just take. <laughs> I'm just taking pictures. Yeah, it's amazing you're in my lab and I don't know this stuff either. Oh, we're learning. We're learning. We're learning. We never stop learning. Oh, did you put both pictures in here? Or just the one. Just the one. One's enough. Yeah. So the I was this was back behind back by the tracks with the uh, the hands off oh. area, and there were there are a lot of mosquitoes back there. There's kind of a tree cover, and they I think they like to stick in the shade during the day. Oh. So. And I hear I've got you walking around back there and look, oh man, I'm such a horrible taskmaster. Every time I go back there, I get sworn by mosquitoes. <laughs> and I was wearing a short sleeve shirt that day and a mosquito landed on me. I was like, well, you know what? I'll give you a blood meal in exchange for uh, some photos. So uh -huh. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. It seemed like a fair exchange. See if I get West Nile or something. <laughs> um, now this is going to be the hard sell to the university though. It's telling we want to have more of this interesting, varied plant life there. Uh, we're going to have to admit, it's also going to mean mosquitoes. And ticks. And ticks. Yes. Um, yeah. There have been a lot, there's been a lot of debate about whether you can remove mosquitoes specifically from an ecosystem without harming the other species. It's been done some places to moderate uh -huh. success, but I they're they're part of the world. We're, yeah, we're yeah. meddling. We're meddling at that point. Yeah, I I, I I kind of feel like yeah, we should we should let students know about things like mosquitoes, and you know we wouldn't necessarily let them get so so thick that people are being drained of blood every day. But you know, you need to go to the local hospital and get yeah blood transfusions just to refill on blood. Right. No. And we'll still have big, wide open spaces with very few mosquitoes to worry about. Well, the idea is if we get a good balanced ecosystem, you're going to have mosquitoes, but you're also going to have the damselflies and the dragonflies and the birds and the bats. And the spiders. And the spiders. Yeah. So the population should be controlled because, like you know, they stay, they stay to the shade during the day, but then 
you know, dust comes and the mosquitoes come out. So do the bats. If you have a healthy bat population, the mosquitoes could be kept uh -huh. in check. It's all about balance. That's what we're going for. We want a balance. It's got to get back in, back in place. Oh, that's cute. This is interesting because I, I diagnosed this a hoverfly because it was a fly and it was hovering in place. That's why I was able to get a uh -huh. shot of it mid-flight with this camera because it wasn't actually moving. I put it on iNaturalist and people were like, that's not a hoverfly. And they said, I think it was Brachian fly, Brachian fly, something like really? that. I'm not a fly expert. Um, okay. So I'm inclined to take their word on that. But it hovers. It was a fly <laughs> and it was hovering. That's all I know. <laughs> that sounds like a hoverfly to me. Okay. We'll learn more. We'll learn more. Oh, here we go. This, I think, is from the barn uh -huh. on campus. I bet you that's Parastatota. Yes, there are a lot of them in there. There's yeah. some on every window, and there's one that I have been treating as my white whale. It's absolutely massive. It's huge, but it stays, its nest is on the top of the window. So I have to like drag something over. There's this bench that they store in there, but it's a rocking bench. So you gotta oh, like put it up yeah, against the wall. That. So, well, no, I'll stand on a precarious rocking bench to get a picture of a giant spider. But <laughs> um, every time I get up there, I disturb it and it runs into its little hole where the wall meets the window. Oh. So I have not been able to get a picture of that giant spider yet in the barn, yeah. but I, I will keep going back and looking for it. I've got a lightweight step ladder. I should bring that over. It sounds safer. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because we want you to get gorgeous pictures of interesting arthropods, but we don't want you to injure yourself in the process. Stand on a rocking bench over yeah. a concrete floor. You put the you push the bench up against the wall and it doesn't rock, you know? So you got oh, some friction. Okay, okay. So yeah, this I gotta figure it out. Uh, this does not sound like something you should tell the safety officer for biology. I am not endorsing standing on rocking benches. <laughs> okay. Same place, different spider. Yeah. That one, I had to look that one up. Yeah. And what was it? I'll have to look it up again because I forgot. But anyway, <laughs> that's not Parasteatoda. That's no. somebody else. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. They're living in harmony, I assume. I've never actually seen two species of spider fight. I don't know if that's I've, a common thing. I've seen, there's a few really nasty, Fulcus is horrible. Fulcus? Yeah, that's the long-legged spider. Oh. The cellar spider. Yeah, well that's, <clears throat> they eat other spiders. Correct. So, yeah, they would attack spiders. Yes. But uh, I just mean like, I don't I don't know if spiders fight over territory, you know? I, I imagine they, that some of them do, but like, if you've got a whole bunch of spiders in one place it's because it's a rich food source and then they don't feel like they have to fight with each other and so yeah but that guy's lovely i gotta figure out who that is yeah i, I very pretty spider yeah i wonder if we when we start spraying insecticides in places and the insects die the spiders might start cannibalizing each other Oh, that's true. It probably happens. Yes. Is that the last one? That was I the think last so. One. We're out of photos, PZ. No, we're not, because I put some of my photos in there, too. Oh, all uh, right. So Violet's talking about all these different forms that are out there. Uh, she's our biodiversity person here, and I'm the rather narrow-minded spider person. So I've got a few of those in here to talk about. So like this little guy, that's a thin-legged wolf spider. And we found that out by the wetlands office. We have a wetlands office here where they, you know, they, we care about wetlands out here because that's where the ducks thrive for the duck hunters. But it also gets these things. And this one was kind of cute because look how stilt-legged it is. It was a hot day. The rocks were very hot. And then it was perched up and just kind of skittering along like that. Our um, chat friend says to avoid pesticides, nematodes are a good way to suppress insects that are becoming a problem. Have you heard about heard using of, nematodes? Heard of that. Yeah, that a... would be. 
that would be an interesting approach. I would be yeah. interested in doing a study on that too, yeah. eventually. I've never heard of using nematodes as a pest yeah. control, but. I know they're easy to raise, but you would have to get the particular species that, well, it's something to explore down the road. Yeah. <clears throat> and this one is a Parson spider. These are also very, an Eastern Parson spider, no less. There's also a Western Parson spider. I can't tell them apart, uh, but this is an Eastern Parson spider. They get their name because of that white band, which reminded somebody of a clerical collar. I thought yeah. the guy who discovered it was just named something or just like no. Jonathan Parson. They're it named his after spider. Parsons. Oh. So those, those are also really common. Uh, these do deliver a pretty sharp bite. So don't mess with them. That's disturbing to hear because we had in my house growing up, my entire childhood, uh, an infestation of these spiders. And I would oh. find them in the bathroom. I woke up to one in my bed once. I don't think I ever got bitten by one, but yeah. I yes, like I mean they're not particularly aggressive. Oh, but I don't but know. they got they got big chelicerae, and they'll they can give you a good bite if they get mad at you. So don't get don't get them mad at you, and it's okay. No, they usually were just chilling. Yeah. Uh, there's Saltica scenicus again. So we got we got lots of those. I find these crawling all over the all over my house. They like windows. Yes. I don't know if they're drawn to light or if that's just where their prey is. Vertical surfaces. Find lots of them on vertical surfaces. I think because the wolf spiders dominate the ground and oh. these guys go up. They're ecological niches. Yeah. Um, and this one is a sack spider. We also have lots of these. And they also give a pretty good bite. So... <laughs> Yeah. Have you been bitten? I have never once been bitten by a spider. Because you're nice to them. Yes. That's, I think that's the message. They've got the capability. They have no desire to bite you. Mm -hmm. They're only going to bite you if you mess with them. Unless you're a fly. Okay. <laughs> that was a good, good segue. This one's got yes. a snack. Yes. Uh, this is a crab orchid spider. And uh, we caught this one. This was on campus. Really? So we actually have some on campus, but on the edges of campus, um, you know, those those nicely tended flower gardens out by the yes. signs. Yeah. Yeah. So we found this one out there. They get they get quite colorful. They actually change color not quickly, but gradually to match the petals of the flowers they, they like to lurk in. That's where they hide out is deep in a flower. Do you know how they do that? No, I don't. I, I don't. I'm not quizzing yeah. you. I'm just curious yeah. if they have some sort of pigment cell, like they. Like oh, they've got it. they've got a variety of different pigment cells. Uh, all spiders do. They can make different kinds of pigment cells, and it's just different species make different distributions of these pigment cells that are right underneath the cuticle. So there's a little blobby cell, right? in the abdomen, lots of them in there that give that color. So they must have good color vision if they're able yeah. to see a color and recreate it. You would think. Um, I've actually got a whole paper on just spider pigments and they, they do a lot of interesting things. Oh, this is a cat face spider. This was my friend who was living at my house for so long um, and it was pretty big. Uh, that body was about the size of my thumb. So a pretty hefty looking spider there. Uh, these are big orb weavers. They nest under the eaves of the house and build pretty elaborate spider webs there. Uh, this one actually took over my deck, built gigantic web across my deck and we couldn't use our deck for about a month because you get eaten. No, because this is our guest. Mm -hmm. We weren't going to mess up our guest's home. Um, and then in the fall, uh, she crawled up into the eaves of the house and laid a giant egg sack that we're keeping an eye on and hope will hatch out soon. So you can have many more guests. And this is why it's called a cat face spider, because on its abdomen, it's got those little bumps. 
So when you look at it from this angle, it looks kind of like a cat face with the two little pointy ears sticking out. Like if H.P. Lovecraft was the one who yes. came up with cats. That's that's a good description. It's the H.P. Lovecraft ver craft version of a kitty cat. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, this one is Tetranatha. Some of you out there might have seen these around. These are orb weavers. So you get a big classic spider web, you know, the orb shaped spider web. And they're sitting in it and they stretch out longitudinally. So the two front legs up front, two back legs in the back. So they look like a little stick sitting in the middle of their of their web. Uh, we just started seeing those just the other day appearing in our garden. So they're, they're starting to take off. Your everyone's favorite, that's jumping spider. So that's always adorable. Yes. This one is the Asiatic wall jumper, Psittacus fasciger. And we got lots of those in our house too. And let's see. Oh, there's, there's Peristatota right there. That's a male. Is this in your garage? uh no where did we i think we saw this one out at the horticulture garden so yeah um the thing about uh parasteatota that makes it different from the spiders we look at is the abdomen has got these kind of modeled patterns on it sort of a camouflage and you can tell this one is a male because look at those palps at the front end of it they're huge Uh, this is Steatota borealis. These are, these are probably among the bigger spiders you find around the house. Um, they get pretty random plump. Uh, this one is from, people who follow my blog know about this. This is from our compost heap. As we got a, a compost bin that is full of Steatota borealis. They're thriving in there. So that this is another thing that interests me is why do we find some spiders in some places and other spiders in other places? Inside the house and on the outside of the house, but near the house, we find Parasteatota. And in this one little environment, we find Steatota borealis. I wonder what would happen if you collected the eggs of the spiders in, in the house and the spiders in the compost and like swapped them swapped them and let them hatch in the different environments would they stay there or would they go out and switch i i think they'd be fine with the i mean so for instance in the compost bin we do occasionally find parasteatota uh is just dominated by steatota borealis but yeah they they seem to be doing fine in there and again they do not eat each other you got these different species and they're all coexisting uh, the other curious thing about Steatora borealis is, like I said, they're living in my compost bin. And then it comes winter, it's going to get really cold and everything's going to freeze and they disappear. And we don't know exactly how they overwinter yet. But you definitely get adult spiders coming back out in the spring. Yeah. So uh, earlier this in May, we went out there and found gigantic Steatota borealis. So apparently they just, they were just hiding. Is that uncommon for spiders in Minnesota? To um, no, it's fairly, a lot of the wolf spiders will do that, for instance. You just don't know where these particular ones yeah. are. Yeah. Probably under the foundation. And this, this may be the, yeah, this may be the fact, factor that affects where we find them is borealis likes this compost bin. And I bet you they burrow down into the warm compost in the winter and they overwinter there and then come out in the spring. So something like that could be a big factor. Parasteatota, when they're outside, we've I've actually watched them longitudinally. And when winter comes, they just die. They don't even try? They don't even try. Well, it's my time. They sit there clinging to their nest until the temperature hits roughly minus four or five degrees centigrade. And then their antifreeze is no longer effective and they die. It's tragic. That's the life of a spider. Okay, there's Steatota triangulosa. That's the one we're working on in the lab right now. Uh, we've got a large colony of these guys. You can see why they're called triangulosa. Get the cute little triangles in their abdomen. 
what we've been doing is working on just cultivating them, breeding them so that we can get multiple generations out of them. Uh, this one is a fifth generation. Uh, so that means it's been inbred for five generations in the lab and still doing fine. We're, we're going to keep on inbreeding them because that, that tends to simplify the genome for other work. Also in this photo, you see up there in the top right, there's eggs. That's an egg sac that's kind of peeled open. Uh, that's what the eggs look like. And that's also what the egg sacs look like. They're kind of this fluffy, cottony stuff. And in the middle, you find a whole bunch of eggs, usually on the order of 20 to 50 eggs in an egg sac. And then we get spiders that lay half a dozen egg sacs within the space of two weeks. So lots of little babies. And that's where we want to go with this next is uh, <clears throat> my other student, Liz, who's not here, is looking at embryological development. So we're going to be looking at the development of these little guys in their egg sac. And this is a nice thing about the spiders. You can just you get an egg sac and they're all synchronous. They're all, they were all laid at the same time, all fertilized at the same time. So you can open them up and you get a whole bunch of little embryos that you can observe continuously and, and watch and see what they do. Um, and then they, then they hatch out into these adorable, cute, cuddly little baby spiderlings. Isn't that neat? I'm sure everyone in the audience is... is one of these. Um, we get lots and lots of these little babies, more than I know what to do with. Uh, some of them escape, and we have been discovering that they are, oh, yeah, I guess right down there. Oh, yeah, there's one now. There's... <laughs> so there's there's lots of them just living wild in the lab, um, which is okay. They're harmless. Uh, they're actually going to struggle a little bit to eat because, you know, we don't have a lot of flying insects buzzing through here. Oh, I might introduce them. Yes. You're, you're going to help the ecosystem. Bringing stuff in here every yes. other day. Yeah, I also, we raise wingless fruit flies for them to feed on. And those often escape, so they're kind of scuttling around. So uh, there's, there's food available for them. Anyway, so that's where we're at. We've been talking for almost an hour. Told you this would be easy. Okay. So that's that's kind of what we had to say. That's where we're going with all these projects. Are there more questions from the audience? Not that, that I can out. see, but I, I think as a layperson, I'll let, maybe just give me a little one-on-one on spider anatomy. Like, for instance, you, you mentioned polyps for a little while ago, and I'm kind oh. of... Like, uh... Okay, uh, yeah, so... Oh, let's see how to, how to explain. There, so spiders differ from insects. Insects typically have three body segments, you know, head, thorax, and abdomen. Spiders just have two. They have a prosoma and they have an abdomen. And uh, so that's one big obvious difference. Uh, spiders have eight legs. And then in addition, they have these specialized mouth parts up at the front of the head. So there's the mouth parts proper, and those are behind uh, chelicerae. Chelicerae are these sheets, these cuti cuticles, cuticle bits that hang down and have a, a fang on the end of it. And they're down here like this, and they, they can do this and chomp on things. Uh, and then in addition, just outside the palp, of, outside of the chelicerae, there's the palps, which are these, I don't want to call them antenna. They're not the equivalent of insect antennae but they're sensory organs and procreative organs. So the males enlarge them and they, they uh, reproduce by collecting semen and storing it in the part in front of their face. And that's what they insert into the female's epigyne. Uh, so males tend to have these gigantic club-shaped palps, which makes them easy to distinguish from the females that have slender, delicate, pencil-shaped palps. But they're also sensory organs. You can sort of see that when they're feeding, that they're touching it with, with their palps. 
Oh, okay, so they sense their environment with their genitals? Goodness. Uh, well, the word genitals gets a little complicated here. <laughs> because uh, these are modified mouth parts that store sperm and can be used as intromittent organs. Oh, God. So, so all sex is oral sex with spiders then? Yes. Oh boy. Yeah. I'm I thought it would be the, the spider pictures that would ruin me. Um instead it's the spider sex. Uh -huh. But I was interrupting there. No, it's okay. Yeah. So that's that's what you need to know about anatomy. There's a lot of details too. I mean uh they have eight eyes, and the air arrangement of the eyes is very diagnostic of what species you're looking at. So like you might have noticed in that crab orchid spider, there's just a nice tidy row of small four, eye, four small eyes at top, four small eyes below it. Um, and then you look at something like a jumping spider, and two of the eyes are greatly enlarged. Nice. It's definitely been educational. I think that someone in the chat pointed out that uh, a Lovecraft beast must have been a spider, based on the description so far. The cats of Ulthar must have been spiders. Okay. I've not read Lovecraft, but that must be... Yeah. He talks a lot about tentacles, though. And spiders don't have tentacles. No, but when you take the cat head with the spider legs coming out of it, oh, it does yeah. look a little okay. bit like something that he would have described. Yeah, that does look a little Cthulhu-like. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess we could end it there. Uh, if people have questions, you can always email me. We're, we're going to be working on this all summer. Violet's going to come up with a whole catalog of all the species that are present on the Morris campus and outlying areas. And uh, maybe make a little pamphlet to hand out to new yes. students to say, here's the arthropods to look out for. Yes. Right. Yeah, that would that would be a good educational project is to be able to tell all the incoming students, here's all the cool arthropods you can find on this campus. And if we want to get uh, we really get into it, we can say, here's the things you won't see on campus. That's true. Because we have too many lawns yeah. to sustain these things. So we probably won't see our Jayapi on campus, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, other things we have in mind is we're planning to make a trip to the, the, this is the classic university thing. We have tunnels under everything. And so we want to explore those for arthropods. So we're going to check that out sometime soon. I'm excited for that. Think yes. there are spiders down there? I know there are spiders down there. <laughs> So, yes, we'll, we will, we should make uh, videos of our journeys into the underworld. And I'll bring this too. Yeah, and I'll bring, I'll bring my GoPro and things like that. So that's something you can look forward to in the next few weeks is maybe we'll get, get a little video of that together. Presumably that's on Frangula, your blog, right? Yes. Or your YouTube channel? Or my YouTube channel. Which I think is just youtube.com slash pz myers no it's youtube.com slash pz myers biology uh -huh. yeah okay let's let's let it go there we'll let violet get home <laughs> and uh let me get home and fix dinner and we'll see everybody later all right see everybody later we'll be seeing you around <laughs>